Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, hope everybody is doing well, alhamdulillah. Um, thank you all for taking the time to join on this uh, rainy night. Um, so we're going to continue, inshallah. We just started this series. It's about the journey of the soul um, and trying to understand where we came from so that we can identify where we're going and so that we can realize the purpose of where we're going and what we're meant to be doing. So we're reviewing this text, um, a very, very short text, um, but very powerful by Imam Abdullah bin Alawi al-Haddad, known as the lives of man basically is a guide to the states of the human soul from before one was conceived, so in the pre-eternal realm, um, to the time that one was conceived, to the life in this dunya, the stages of life in this dunya, then to the barzakh, which is the intermediary realm when one passes away, um, and then the uh, uh, day of judgment when one is resurrected, ultimately to eternal life. So he walks through in just enough detail um, what the essential components of each of these lives are and then what the Muslim needs to know and what the Muslim needs to do as we navigate uh, this part of our journey. So um, last time we covered the first life, which is the, the creation, when the human being was originally created until right before they are conceived. And this is the life of uh, the, the, the day in which Allah takes the covenant. So we talked about what does it mean when we took the Covenant. Allah mentioned in Surah Al-A'raf that he gathered all of the children of Bani Adam and he asked them, um, am I not your Lord? And everybody responded, uh, we, we say yes and we respond and we witness, we bear witness. And so Allah basically then says that you can't deny this at, at a later date because you this event did happen. And then we talked about how all of these darknesses that come over our soul and these veils and these layers that come over the human soul and over the heart veil us from remembering these moments and they veil us from remembering this reality which is why when we need to remember something we do dhikr which is remembrance it gets us away from heedlessness and forgetfulness and so the more one polishes their heart the more closer one gets the more the reality of that event and the reality of bearing witness before our lord and saying yes you are our lord and, and that was in a real way, it wasn't some figurative concept, um, that will start to sink into the human being. So that's what we covered last time. Um, so this time, inshallah, we're going to get into the second um, life, which is essentially the life of the dunya, from the time that somebody is uh, in the womb of their mother, um, and then this life has multiple stages. It has that time, then it has the time of childhood, uh, then it has the time of youth, then it has the ages of maturity, and then it has the ages of um, old age, and then there, uh, when someone is on their way out, what, he, what is translated as kind of uh, decrepitude, and then finally when one actually passes. So we're going to split this up into two classes. We'll cover the first three or four of those stages today, inshallah, and then we'll get into the next ones. Um, so he says that this life begins from the time that one is delivered out of the womb, and, um, it, and it ends when one departs this world. Um, and this is this section that we're about to talk about. This is the purpose of human life. This is the purpose of human, uh, of human existence. Um, so the human being has a very, very specific purpose for why they were created. And it is the test in this life, Allah says in the Quran, that we created life and death in order to test which one of you would be uh, best indeed. Uh, uh, that we will be created life and death in order to test which one of you are best indeed. This is the life that is being referred to. So the life that we're in right now. Most of us, we think this is the only life. So we, when we talk about, okay, well, we, we have a life, this is the, the time we're referring to. But he clarifies, no, there was there's time before this and there's time after this. But this is the evaluation period. So it begins um, that in the realization that whatever we do here, there's consequences. Allah, especially when the age of accountability starts, which we'll talk through in a few minutes, inshallah, Allah starts to take people to account for their actions in this life. Um, there's not a free pass forever. And so the end will either be as a result of the investments we make now in the akhirah, the end is either eternal bliss or eternal perpetual torment. Those are the two sides that someone has to choose from. And we actually have a choice in that because whatever we do here will have that result and will have that impact 
um, and, 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 and ultimately it's Allah's good pleasure and Allah's mercy, but Allah does give us a roadmap for what you need to do to get to Jannah, what you need to do to get to what you need to do um, uh, incorrectly, um, if you, and, and you won't get to Jannah. So, but he starts with this time in the womb, and he just wants to, to mention this um, as, as a way for someone to, uh, it's kind of like a prologue, he says. So this is the prologue to this life, right? Like the, 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 the before one is actually born, they're where? They're in the womb of their mother. But Allah does describe this in detail in the Quran, um, where he says that we created man, we created a human being from a product of clay, so from clay. And then we placed him as a drop in a safe lodging place. And then we made of that a lump of bones. And then we made of that a lump of bones. And then we covered the bones with flesh and then brought him forth as another creation. So blessed be Allah, the best of creators, the greatest of all creators. So Allah is describing this as before. Keep in mind that the Quran is the eternal speech of Allah. But this was revealed in a time where there was no way to understand the development of the embryo and the fetus and everything that takes place inside the womb of the mother. Right? Like there was no way for someone to know all of these specific steps. Allah describes it in a lot of detail. He says, oh mankind, in another surah, should you be in doubt concerning the resurrection, then know the following, that we created you from dust, then from a drop of seed, then from a clot, then from a lump of flesh, shapely and shapeless, and then Allah shaped it. And then we make it clear for you, and we cause what we will to remain in the wombs for an appointed time. So Allah is describing this process that's taking place. Usually this would be considered unseen for people, right? So this would have been considered something happening in the unseen realm. Obviously it's in this realm, but it was not something that people would have witnessed to. Allah is describing what that process is, and then there's hadith which describe it in a lot more detail. But this is when the um, uh, life of the human being essentially has now started, right? So the, when it, when it, there's a portion of time at which the soul is blown in, the spirit is blown in to the uh, embryo. And now the life of that human being started. And now the baby, the interactions that they have, or the, the fetus, the interactions that they have, the way that their uh, mother does certain things, um, that impacts them. From a spiritual perspective, it has a deep-rooted impact. So he said it really starts at this point. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in um, another narration that all of you will have had their created existence brought together in their mother's womb as a drop, as a nutfa for 40 days, then as a alaqa, a clot for 40 days, then as a mudva, as a piece of flesh for the same period of time, after which Allah sends the angel to blow the room, to blow the spirit into the human being. And he says, now this angel is commanded to write. What does this angel write? It writes a few things. First, it writes all the provision that you're going to get in this life. The provision, the risk. It's already been predetermined by Allah in the eternal tablet, the Loh and Mahfud. It's already been predetermined. But now this angel is writing it. This is what this person is going to get in this entire life. It also writes their lifespan. So his and her lifespan is written at this point. Right? So at the point at which the root is blown in, the lifespan of the human being has already been decided. It writes their deeds and it writes whether they will end up wretched or joyful. And then he, so, so we'll, 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 the hadith continues, so we'll just pause there. The first thing to keep in mind is that Allah already wrote our risk for us. At this point, there's very little to stress about if it's already been decided. As a human being, one of the chief things, as we talked about in the last class, Imam Ghazali, human being worries about his risk. Where's my money going to come from? Where's my job going to come from? How am I going to get income? How am I going to get this? How am I going to get that? Well, Allah already wrote. What are the times of abundance? What are the times of difficulty? What are the times of constriction? What are the times of expansion? What are the times of ease? What are the times of health? Your risk is your money, your income, but it's not just that. It's who you get married to or don't get married to. It's your friends. It's your company. It's, it's, it's your, your company, meaning your, your social circle. All of these things are part of your provision. And these have already been all predetermined. And Allah says that they are tests for you in certain ways. So not everything Allah gives is a, um, uh, something that's purely just given without wisdom. Everything has a wisdom to it. The risk can be a blessing and a test in various ways. Abundance can also be a test, just like poverty and, and difficulty and adversity can be a test. He says the lifespan is also already written. 
this point. So nobody can increase um, or decrease what Allah has already written for them eternally uh, in, 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 in his realm. And then he says, and this is interesting, and this part needs a little clarification. He says, the Prophet says, by the one besides whom there is no God, one of you may do the works of the people of Jannah until they are separated only by an arm's length from the end. And then the, what had been written overtakes them and they start to do the works of the people of the fire and they enter it. And he says, and one of you may do the works of the people of the fire until nothing remains between the, between the fire and, but an arm's length, uh, between them and the fire but an arm's length. And then what is written overtakes them so that he or she does the works of the people of Jannah and then enters it. There's various ways the ulama interpret this hadith. Um, and a few, a few of the different uh, things that are mentioned in the commentaries. One, this should put fear inside the life of every human being, the most righteous, obedient person, and it should give hope to the most sinful person. Right? We all have times where we're steeped in sin, and many of us are doing a lot of things that are wrong and that are inappropriate. And then we have times where hopefully we are being able, we are obedient. This should give humility to the people of obedience, not an arrogance of, I'm guaranteed hajjana, and this is all, that uh, the Muslim never operates like that. That I just have to do X, Y, Z, and for sure I'm doing it. No, 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 that's not how it works. Allah decides when, if, uh, and how much he's going to give. And it should also give hope to somebody who lives a very, might live a very, um, a life full of transgression, but then at the end, Allah facilitates for them. Like there might be people who don't embrace Islam at all, and then they embrace Islam on their deathbed. Everything is wiped clean, and um, they get to enter into the into uh, they've entered the religion now, and then they pass away and they return to their Lord. The second interpretation that ulama say about this is that one may think that they're doing the actions of the people of Jannah, but actually they've been doing actions of the people of Hellfire the whole time. Why? Because all their actions are not for Allah, and this is we talked about this at length last time or in the last class. Their actions might be insincere. Their actions may appear like they are for the sake of people, but rather they are for the sake of Allah, but rather they are for the sake of people. This is why in one hadith that mentions the first to enter and the first to be questioned and be thrown into the fire are the people of, of, of scholarship in Quran. Instead of mentioning all the other criminal activities that are done, people who recite in Quran for the sake of people noticing and people who um, uh, learned and, and did good for the sake of people praising them and, and attention, status, and fame, and so on and so forth. They're very dangerous things. So one may think that they were doing actions of good, but they actually, the entire time, were doing actions of wrong. So it's like the outward form looked great, but inside was, was rotten poison, right? And so it's not going to be pure, the same as something inside that's actually pure. The outward and the inward have to be correct. Which is why in Islam, the science of purification exists. and Which is why it's so important to study that because somebody who doesn't learn how to purify their heart could get into this state. And then he says, somebody may have been doing the actions outwardly that were haram, but inwardly they were always returning back to their Lord and repenting and, and broken before him and, and had a yearning to fix themselves. But they just kept doing the wrong. But they, Allah, I really want to improve. I really want so. There's different ways in which Allah examines. So we should all have hope when we sin that as long as we are turning back to Allah and we're not sinning arrogantly. There's a difference between the arrogant sinner who says, I'm not even sinning. This isn't even a sin. This is not even a big deal. Uh, or what's the big deal? Everybody else is doing it. And the one who says, I'm really messing up right now. Like, I really should be doing this. Ya Allah, I'm really, really ashamed and I feel sorry that I'm doing this. But... I can't help it. My nafs has the best of me. I got to work on myself. The two are very different categories. Um, so there's various other interpretations that are given, but those are those are a few. So he then um, uh, mentioned the lifespan, the deeds, and then again, hold their ultimate end. One, a human being will be facilitated towards good, as Allah, Allah mentions in the Quran, or they will be prevented from good. And we should always ask that Allah make us people who are facilitated towards good. But really, the spiritual journey of the human being begins at the time that they're in the womb, and the actions and the um, that, that, that are done in the outside environment will impact the, the child that's in the womb. 
will impact the child that you move. Um, and then this hadith also gets into other details that one can study to understand why in Islam um, abortion is also a very serious topic because once the roof has blown in, has been blown in, um, this is not something that's permissible for us to uh, uh, for us to take on. So it's, it's very common, unfortunately, now um, in in the political realm uh, for people to think that uh, these types of things are totally okay and have. There's room for them. There's room for them. It's in various cases, there's room. But the generality in our religion is that life is to be preserved because Allah has created life and it is not permitted out of fear of poverty or for various other reasons um, for one to abort. But that's not what the purpose of the class is, so we'll, we'll move on. Um, so then this is when now with life, the accountability starts to, it's, it's, we're about to get to this really, really important stage. So he says, then you enter into childhood. So this is the, the, the first real stage of this dunya. He said the human being remains in the womb until Allah wills for them to come forth. When whatever day or hour, moment Allah decided, that's when the human being is going to come, not one day sooner, not one day later. He says this is the beginning of life in this world, as Allah says in the Quran, and afterward we bring you forth as infants. Then we give you growth so that you may attain your full strength. So he maps out what's going to happen to the human being. And then among you are those who die, others who are brought back to the worst time of life, referring to the age of decrepitude and um, really advanced old age, um, so that after having had knowledge, they know nothing at all. Right? So some people might have lived a very um, a lot of uh, benefits in their life, but then they get into an age where now they don't remember anything or are afflicted with severe disease or tribulation. And old age is mentioned as that type of uh, tribulation and when one suffers these things. And then Allah says in another surah, one attains full strength, and then that you become old. So Allah talks about, again, the different stages. Why does he talk about the different stages? Because he wants you to now understand, he wants us to understand, there's a purpose to each stage. And the Prophet ﷺ gives context to what the stages are. So the strength that somebody has when they're, uh, the energy that someone has when they're a child, or the memory that they have when they're a child, is not the same as someone when they're much later. And then the strength that someone has in their like 20s and 30s is not the same as the strength or lack of strength someone has in their 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s. And we always ask Allah preserve us and give us lots of help. But this is the key for understanding the wisdom behind why Allah created different stages of the human being's life. And then what the purpose of each of those stages of life is. Because the natural inclination of the human being is to say, I have plenty of time. I'll do it later. I'll do all of my ibadah later. I'll wait till I'm this age. I missed a bunch of prayers. It doesn't matter. I'll make them up when I'm 70 years old or whatever. If the human being is a procrastinator by its nature. The nuts likes to do that. But there's a lot of benefit from childhood in someone understanding what their purpose is and someone understanding the, the, the uh, reason why um, Allah has given them that. So he says in this stage, a couple of things happen. He says people move from um, the state of childhood to puberty. And then that's when this state of childhood is done. And then they go into the stage of youth and, and young adulthood, and then to maturity and then to seniority. So these are the different stages we're going to talk through. Um, but first, he says there's something happens when, they, when each human being is born. He says when every human being is born, they begin to scream. And this is mentioned in the narration. This is because now they have a Satan, a Satan who actually goes there and literally, in a, in, a, in, a, in a very real sense, stabs the human being. And they try to harm that human being. He says, everybody was afflicted by this except Jesus, son of Mary, Isa alayhi salam, Isa ibn Maryam, because he was guarded by this because of the prayers of Mary, Maryam alayhi salam's wife, uh, the wife of, or Maryam alayhi salam's mother, the wife of Imran. Um, and so, uh, where she says in the Quran Surah Ali Imran, that, oh Allah, I seek your protection for her. This is when Maryam alayhi salam is born, and she makes this dua. I seek your protection for her and for her offspring from shaitan, from Satan the Rukhujit. And because Allah accepted that dua of the mother of Maryam alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam was prevented from this, this happening to him. Um, and, it, and so, I mentioned in the hadith that he at least arrived at that moment, but a protective veil came, and, and he, was, he was prevented from this. And that's what happens now. There, a shaitan is also created to be assigned to a human being, 
when they are born. Okay, they say a, a demo a gene is created to be assigned to human being when they are born. So that's, that's an important part of our framework to keep in mind that while we have angels with us, there are also shaping that are with the human being, and they study the human being over the course of their life to understand their weaknesses and find how to have against them. So then he says, at the moment when someone is born, a few things that one is supposed to do uh, to, the, to the child. They do the adhan in the right ear and the iqama in the left ear. Usually the father um, will do this, the adhan in the right ear and the iqama in the left ear. And this is um, the first very real, this is sunnah, it's the first real call to um, remind them of Allah. Right, so one is literally calling them to prayer. That's the first thing. Or calling, making the call to prayer, um, which is a very, very noble call, full of a lot of uh, deep remembrances of Allah. The second thing is when somebody passes away. So when we do the janaza prayer, is that anyone? When we do the funeral prayer, has anyone ever seen anyone do an adhan or akama for the funeral prayer? There's no adhan and akama for the funeral prayer because that adhan and akama was already done when you were born. When you were born. And this, this, it said that the time of your life is like the time between the Adhan and the Akama in reality. So when somebody came here for Isha Salah, the Adhan was made maybe 655, uh, Akama was maybe 702. That time, five, six minutes, is the time of the life of the human being. And it was already done. So from that moment, the human being is supposed to realize, I'm here for a reason and I'm here for a purpose. And so that, 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 that should sink in, even in the mind of the parents, as excited as they are, that I have a responsibility now to make sure that I put in the effort to raise this child to be righteous, because one day they will have to go, and then uh, the janazah will be prayed over them. And the efforts that one put in, and the way in which they were raised, um, that's going to ultimately determine, Allah's mercy, um, where they end up going, and if they fulfill the purpose of their, of their life. The second thing the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned that, that every child is born in their fitra. This is known as the primordial disposition, this innocent disposition. Every child is born in the fitra, and it is their parents who make them a Jew, a Christian, or a Zoroastrian, or whatever other religion, but these are the ones that are mentioned in the Hadith. What does it mean to be born in the fitra? Your primordial nature has you focused has us focused on submitting to Allah. Submitting to Allah and the religion of Islam is the religion of submission and the religion of Islam is 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 uh, uh, being a Muslim means the one who is who, who does submit, who has submitted, the one who submits. This is not referring only to the Sharia. So there's the Sharia of Islam, which is the law of Islam, and then there's the nature that the human being has been created in, which is in sync, even before the formal sharia of the Prophet ﷺ came from, there were still people who were created in their fitra. And we know that the prophets um, and many of the other righteous who came before the Prophet ﷺ, they were inclining towards their fitra. And the fitra, as you believe, has an inclination towards a belief in oneness, in oneness of God. That's the fitra. And anyone now, life after one is born, will cover that up, will change it, will add things to it. But it's very difficult for someone um, to come to other conclusions on their own. Like, so for example, a, ch a child, once they reach a certain stage, will start to think about how were they created, where were they created from. And it is very much a um, normal inclination for that child to say, I was created from a Lord, from a God, because it's, it's Allah has deposited in them. That child on their own would never come to the conclusion that I was created from a God who then had a son who then also manifests in a uh, in the Holy Spirit, who but actually all of it's one, and then the Logos is coming into the Holy Spirit through the man, but it's really one God, but it's actually three, and then one of them actually died for my sin, so I don't have to take any accountability in life. That conclusion, a rational human being who's in alignment with their fitra would never come to that conclusion on their own would never come to that conclusion on their own. And neither did the, that, that was never the teaching of Isa alayhi salam, but that was obviously changed um, uh, by, by people um, in the first 100, 200, 300 years after um, Isa alayhi salam passed away. But the fitra, 
the fifth row will remain intact. The fifth row will remain intact. And so it can be uncovered, which is why people convert, or as, as folks would say, revert to Islam, because the fitra is still there. The goal of, of, of our life is to help our children remain in their fitra for as long as possible. And for ourselves as adults, because inevitably our fitra will have been messed up or tarnished or ruined or um, veiled in some way, peel it, peel it back, peel it back until it comes back and we start to realign with uh, who we are supposed to be. And then the goal for the rest, for, for our responsibility as Muslims, for as many people in society as possible, is actually not a top-down, let me force people to accept a religion. La ikram fi din Allah said there's no compulsion in religion. But rather, how can one help somebody unlock what's already inside of them by portraying to them how beautiful it actually is? So the, the, the Prophet them, and then the scholars who have inherited from him, what they do is they pull the beauty out of people to help them realize that it's already inside of them. And then as a result, of course, Allah is the guide. He guides them to, um, to Islam. And, and, and so that's really the, the ultimate, one of, our, one of our responsibilities as Muslims is to help people do that. But we first have to, of course, help ourselves. And then, inshallah, that's the way that we can go. So this, this concept of fitrah is really, really important. And any innocence, um, or, or any corruption of the innocence is corruption of the fitrah. Fitrah has a very pure quality to it. So then he gets now into, well, what is the job of now one is created? So what happens at this point? He says now they are in the responsibility of their parents, and their parents' job is to protect the fitrah. And how do they protect the fitrah? Multiple things. He says first is, don't let them be exposed to things consistently that will distort their fitra, that will distort this primordial disposition and this innocence. Then number two, give them a love of goodness. So children innately love goodness. They're pure, very pure. Like they love cute animals and they love stuffed animals and all the cute things. It's a very normal thing for this which the child loves, right? But a, but, but, but a human being, an adult, they don't, they might not have the same, you know, inclination that I don't I don't care. Especially people who like really, uh, uh, their heart is really covered, like they won't even be impacted emotionally by certain things. Um, a sign of fitra is also how often one cries. So how often one weeps and is impacted by, by, by deep events, um, it's a sign that they're intact with their fitra versus if their heart is covered and covered and covered, that's a sign that and one doesn't, is not impacted emotionally. It's, it's a sign that the fitra is not as intact as one, one needs to work on. He says then, they also are responsible to encourage them to do good and then discourage them and make them dislike and hate evil. So they should love goodness and love the people of goodness and love the actions of goodness. And they should hate evil the practice of it, and the actions of the people who are practicing it. The actions of the people who are practicing it, and the practice of it. So that's the, the, the second responsibility. The third is uproot the love of dunya, money, fame, all these things from the heart. Don't let the, the child, as they're growing up, fall in love with these things, with the dunya. And we talked about this again at length in the last class, uh, the Imam Ghazali, in the text of Imam Ghazali, that what the dunya will do and how it will ruin the human being. And how loving this dunya and all the glitz and the glamour and the power and the corruption, everything that can happen because of the love of the dunya. So a parent who is following the teachings of the sunnah, and we ask that Allah give us the tawfiq to do that, they're following the teachings of the sunnah of the Prophet they will um, be working on these things. So then, before we get into the age of prayer and then after that the age of um, uh, puberty, why is, what does one do then in the society in which we live, where from you know age one or two, one is it can be exposed to so much haram and so much um, so many problematic things. First, one has to we have to understand what the responsibility is of, of 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 guarding a saint of Allah. When Allah creates children, they're saints. Saints meaning because they're, 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 there's no sins upon them, right? So they're completely pure. So now a parent has been given has been charged with the duty of protecting their innocence and maintaining that as much as possible. So now one now has to act like a shield in a lot of ways to prevent the onslaught 
that's coming forth their way, especially in Western society when there's no concept of fitra, there's no concept of um, uh, really of God in most places anymore. There's no concept of an afterlife. So then it's like, well, it's free game. Whatever anybody wants to do, they want to do. So, so, so one has to be actively aware of those things. And starting from young ages, we have to make sure we are guarding our children against all the uh, insidious forms of media that exist, against all the problematic television, um, shows, things on YouTube, even like inappropriate commercials. I mean, there's all sorts of filth that enters into the heart and it will immediately corrupt the heart. Immediately corrupt the heart. Like I remember I was, I went to um, someone's house and they had a, a, a Niners game on. And literally as we walked into the house, there in the Niners game, there's like 15 cheerleaders dressed completely inappropriately and in, in this house. And my son is there, a year old. And I'm just like, I can't, I can't let it, what is this? I can't let him see this. It's completely haram for him to see. It's haram for anybody to see, but you do not want to let a child get exposed to something like that, right? So now I don't think they, they intended on doing that. You know, for them, it was just a, a football game or whatever is on, but one has to be aware if you're watching television, the commercials, the way people are dressed, the language that people are using, the music that's there, all of those things, that impacts the child's heart and they will do the actions that they see. And so, in the society we live in, where innocence, they want innocence to get corrupted. There's, that's, that's an intentional part of the agenda that exists in the society on all sides of the aisle for innocence to get corrupted. It's not something that's being hidden anymore, and it's part of a, a, a deeper Dajjalic agenda that's been in existence for some time. One has to be on guard against this stuff and has to be aware that, hold on a second, yes, I'm living in the West, but I can't let the downfalls of Western society and the corruption and the uh, problematic agendas and all sorts of crazy concepts that they're teaching, teaching children at age seven, eight, nine, you can choose your gender, there's multiple genders that exist. All of it is against Islam, all of it. Allah made, makes it very clear, very clear what the Islamic teaching is. Dhakar wa unta, man and female, khalas, no in-betweens. There's no, so all this pronouns, all these different types of things, this is not congruous with the Islamic upbringing. This will corrupt the fitra. And then children from a young age will start to get confused. And when they start to get confused, they will start to behave in a problematic way. And that's not, that's not appropriate. Same thing with the amount of uh, uh, ways in which this society teaches us to disrespect parents. I remember if anyone has ever watched like Family Guy or South Park or all these shows, I mean, it's, it starts even earlier than that. But it's, when I was young, my, we came here from, uh, Pakistan and so my parents barely like understood English so at one, one point we were watching like cartoons and the only cartoon that was on was The Simpsons and so we were like children we didn't know what The Simpsons so we just thought oh, it's a cartoon let's watch the cartoon and then my parents like at some point started watching it with like they were watching it for a second like wait what is this what this is not this is not child I mean it was absolute inappropriate jokes and, it's, and they do it very very kind of insidiously um, but this was this was like 20 25 years ago right? this was a while ago it's, it's gotten much 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 worse but the point is is sometimes you just don't even know it was like oh this is there wasn't an, an intentional effort to research what's the Simpsons it was a, it's a cartoon there's a baby in the show there, there it's all probably fine whatever it is and same thing with a bunch of the other cartoons that were on TV it wasn't until you get older you realize, hold on a sec, these, these cartoons have problematic um, thoughts and they have problematic um, agendas behind them. And a lot of people who create them have a lot of corruption. So he says, protect from that young age against all of these impulses with the goal of protecting the fitra. And if we didn't protect ourselves, like you know, all the Simpsons and everything, we have to now do the work to undo that. Okay, hold on, I know there's certain things maybe that we were exposed to that maybe we regret. Right? And that were haram influences. So now one has to um, uh, undo all of that. And that's what practicing Islam just in and of itself, the Prophet Islam tells us, like bathing in a river multiple times a day. That's what praying, making wudu and praying is. So, of course, he says, with somebody who does that five times a day, will they not be clean? Of course, they'll be clean. So, our actions, alhamdulillah, help us from this. But if we get a chance to do it, you know, with, with children, with our children, we should do our best to do the utmost to protect them. He says the next is, then do not let any, uh, do not let yourselves, your families, but especially your children, associate 
with bad company. So we spoke about it in the last class as well. And you'll see all the books, they're all linked because it's all one teaching at the end of the day, which is the teaching of the Pauls of Sodom, right? And so it was about bad company, bad friends, bad people to hang out with, and the impact that has. So it says people who are heedless or who are caught up in sinning or caught up in frivolity, that is going to have a negative impact on your family and negative impact on your children. And he says that it's a, in, in one quote, um, that the ruining of children, so of someone usually stems from associating with other people who have let that happen to their to their children or to or or again it could just be to content these days it doesn't have to be with people it could just literally be um, with, with 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 what somebody is consuming but this is very much very important to protect oneself against so if for example you pray and your child sees you pray so now they're getting to the age where they're going to pray right hopefully especially you know once they get to like seven it's really critical that they pray. Um, but even before then, children will do what their parents are doing. They'll start praying early. They'll start just trying to pray. And now you regularly associate or hang out with people who just don't pray at all and like just reject the prayer. And it's not like a valid excuse, like a woman on a cycle or something like that. It's like they're now, and then the children reject the prayer. So now when that happens, what are the child going to think? Uh, hold on a second. Why do they, why don't they, why aren't they praying? What about, what about them? Why is that? And, and it doesn't make sense to them that, oh, well, they have a choice and they're not going to do it. And that doesn't make sense to them because prayer is obligatory, right? It's not like an optional thing. We're not talking here about reciting Quran or, you know, doing something extra. This is an essential thing. So children should be exposed, ideally, to families who are trying to uphold similar values as them, right? Um, and, uh, and, and, and ideally, that will then foster an environment where they're learning together and where they're um, uh, understanding the importance of worshiping Allah. He says then that he says once they reach this age of seven, so again, he's literally going from the time of birth until the time of death. So he's going to that this is broken up in Firman Gita, which is why we'll split this up into two or three classes in Um He says they'll reach the age of seven, and at this point, one must get them to start praying and start having discipline for, for when prayer is not done. Because prayer is the first obligation. It's absolutely fundamental. It's the first question one is asked on the day of judgment, and it should be taken very seriously. And if so from a young age, a child knows that there's not really an excuse. It's not about only praying two or three prayers. It's not about always missing Fajr, but praying the rest. It's every prayer matters. And they're being told from an early age that every prayer matters. Now what's going to happen is the weight of that thing is going to be taken seriously. But their, their accounting does not begin until puberty. So Allah, it's mentioned in one narration that the pen is withheld from three people. A child until they reach puberty, um, a sleeper until they awake, and a, and a mad person until they recover from their madness, from their insanity. Um, so the, the, there's no, the angels are not writing anything down until the age when a child hits puberty. At that age, if somebody does any good act, right, from that age until one in puberty, 12, 14, 15, whatever age it ends up being, um, it's recorded as, as a good deed for the parents. It's recorded as a good deed for the parents in the scrolls of the parents. Um, and it is hoped that all the good deeds they also do afterwards will also be recorded in the parents' good deed, in the parents' scrolls, as well as the uh, children's scrolls, because the parents hopefully were the ones who helped them um, get there. So he says, then once puberty comes, accountability starts, and they, they reach the stage of being of, of being accountable. And at this point, they already should have been taught the injunctions and the commands of Allah and the prohibitions. These things should have already been clear to the children. It's not that you start teaching at that age, because now the accountability has already started. So like, if you teach them at this point that it's haram to, you know, to, um, uh, to curse or whatever else it is and they're like saying bad words and now you teach them that hey don't say bad words at this age that's going to become a problem because the accountability has already started the right? same thing with any of the other um, uh, good deeds that one is supposed to do or rather faraid one is supposed to do and then the haram that one is supposed to stay away from so he says at this point God commands two angels one on their right one on their left these are real angels it's not figurative that exists with every human being to record their deeds. The right is recording the good deeds, and the left is recording their sins. And Allah says that, 
that above you are guardians, is in the Quran, noble in recording, aware of what you do. And so when the two receivers receive them, seated on the right and on the left, he utters no word, but there is with him an observer ready. And if the human, if the child can learn, and we can learn from whatever age we are able to start learning this, but hopefully children can learn this early on, that somebody is watching you. So if someone starts off with the goal of knowing Allah is always watching me, but to help them realize that, they start with saying, I have two angels watching me and writing everything down. They will act differently. How do we know? Take, start doing an action and then have somebody come with like a big camera and start recording your action. You'll immediately start to straighten up and not act in that way, right? You see this with, um, uh, with especially when someone is doing something wrong. Start, if we're speeding on the freeway and then we see a cop car, everybody slows down. Right? And because you know now somebody's watching, right? Even though before we we're still going at the speed, but that we didn't necessarily think anybody was watching. Um, so the human being, I remember even yesterday I was walking somewhere and there was like a bunch of camera crews everywhere, like ABC7, all sorts of different crews, and with their cameras out. And um, uh, it, I, I just thought of this example. I was like, you know, this is. I'm trying to like be on my best behavior with a camera that's going to publish in the news. I don't know which who's there. We're just watching a bunch of people and like on the street. Um, but the the reminder should be Allah has a recording of your whole of our whole life and it's being recorded. And Allah will start that the accounting of that recording at the time where one hits puberty. And so then it continues and continues and continues until one dies. And the angels they're writing everything down, recording, recording, recording. And in, in, when we repent, and in Ramadan, and in these blessed times, the bad is erased, which is great, right? Which is a really, really big blessing that our religion has. There's not, it's not actually difficult to repent um, in our religion, religion of Allah. But that, 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 that seriousness and kind of like a, a, an awe of the accountability should be instilled from when somebody is young so that they realize. Um, and it shouldn't be taught in a way that's like, this is pretend. You know, it's like a made up thing. It's a very real thing. And the more the parents act like that, the more one will start to realize how serious this is. He says, and then at this point, one starts to remind them, right? Of um, So they had all this time where they just had to, to, to pray, or sorry, to play, essentially, um, and to just not have any accountability. And then the accountability starts. And so it's the job of the parents to continue reminding them while they're in their care that you're now accountable. You have to do the following and teaching them their religion. That also comes on, on the parents to teach us our religion. And if we didn't learn it, or if we haven't taught it, or um, if we have, we didn't get, get, get a chance to get taught it, we have to do that work ourselves, right? At whatever age we're at, whether it's 25 or 73, whatever age we're at, we have to at some point learn our religion, especially if we didn't learn it. This is all the part of the ayin become essential to know. What are the part of the ayin? These are the individual obligations, the obligations of knowing um, uh, your, 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 your acts of worship, how to make wudu properly, how to pray properly, how to fast properly, how to pay zakat properly. And then once someone has the ability to go to hajj, how to go to hajj, the nuances of when is prayer, how does one pray when traveling, all these sorts of things. Right? Not just Otherwise, what happens in the human mind is one just makes things up. They're just like, well, yeah, I'll do it like this, or I'll do it like this, because they weren't taught. But if somebody realizes the significance of knowledge from a young age, then that child will prioritize, and, and that family will prioritize knowledge as they continue to grow. And that's of the utmost importance to take knowledge very, very seriously. So he says, keep reminding, keep reminding, even at puberty, um, they still need encouragement and reminding and explanations of all the haram things, the prohibited things. Um, and, uh, and, and he mentions the major sins in here. So he says, remind them about the obligations like prayer and fasting, keep them away from the prohibited things like adultery, drinking alcohol, homosexuality, wrongfully consuming other people's money, stealing, uh, usury, interest, um, coercion, deceit, and the list of sins go on. So he, he mentions a few of the key ones to just make sure. And then whatever in the society you are in, that we are in, whatever sins happen to take, a, um, Precedence in that society, one should make sure their children really understand that those things are sins. Um, because uh, different societies are confined for different types of um, sins, and that can literally be even different towns and communities 
depending on uh, the, the time that they want us in. So uh, this is um, this is also really really uh, important. So these obligations one has to learn. Then after this point, one hits the stage of youth. What is the stage of youth? Um, the scholars define these stages slightly differently, um, but some say that this stage goes up until right after puberty until one is about 35 or, or 40. So this is a pretty significant um, uh, stage. So Ibn Josie, um, the scholar, he says that childhood ends at roughly 15 and then youth goes from 15 to 35 or 15 to 40. Youth is the main time it, that somebody is ideally getting their, not just their foundations, their foundations should happen in late childhood, early youth, but this is the time now for someone to start working and taking life seriously. Why? He says a few things happen in youth, so we'll cover this, um, we'll cover this briefly and then we'll, we'll end, um, so I don't want it to get too late. So he says, this is a stage where one has energy. So the vast majority of people in this room are in the stage of youth and and others are still in their heart in the stage of youth. Uh, and so that the himma that one has, the, the energy and the aspiration is of the utmost importance. Muslims traditionally always taught their children, especially in the early generation, the purpose of their life and they gave them adult responsibilities when they became adults. Adult wasn't 18, adult was once you became able-bodied and you had maturity mentally at the age of puberty and a little bit after that, it takes a little bit of time, right, to kind of come into that. But there was no intermediary stage of adolescence or just long teenage period where everybody just gets to do whatever they want, all the excuses, disobey, do this, this and that, and they were just, oh yeah, they're just teenagers, totally fine. According to which religion is it totally fine? Not ours, right? In our religion, there is a Sayyidina Osama bin Zayd radiallahu anhu, the Sahaba, he was 18 when he led his first army. He led the army into battle. And while the senior Sahaba were present, but the Prophet وسلم, chose him specifically because of leadership qualities that he had at age 18. Imam al-Haddad, the one who wrote this book, the last book that we did with him, the book of assistance, so before the, uh, the uh, book of Imam Ghazali, he wrote that in his late 20s. He wrote that entire book. And in his teenage years, he would pray 100 rakah of Salat al-Duha in the morning. What is Salat al-Duha? That's an optional prayer that one does from about 7.40 a.m. right now, about 15 minutes after sunrise, until about Duhar. After his long Quran lessons or his other lessons, just 100 rakah in the masjid, and would just go to different masajids and keep praying and praying and praying. This is what they would do. We don't have to be like this, but we need to know who our, who our teachers are from a young age. Are who our um, and, and our children should know the names of these people of, of the righteous. So they, they names, of course, of the prophets and then of the Sahaba and who to look up to, so that they're not looking up to like, oh yeah, this guy can shoot like web out of his fingers and like this guy can can you know fly and uh, great, that's all fine. Most of them are white dudes anyways with certain uh, you know Zionist agenda, so that's a whole separate thing. But but the, at the end of the day, they're, they're not our role models. None of them. They're fake characters anyways. Um, but our children in the society we live in, they're taught all sorts of just strange things. They're not really taught how to be um, adults, like and, and kind of and men taught to, being taught how to be men, and women being taught how to be women. Women are usually a little bit ahead of the men, so usually we're falling behind. You know, there's men until they're in their late twenties, early thirties to this day, still playing video games online, chatting with their buddies online, PlayStation, doing things. This is not the job of a man. A man has a job. A man has a dignity. A man has a responsibility in this ummah. This has to be taught. The, the men around the Prophet they knew what it was to be a man. They understood this. So from the time of youth, he says a few things. He says, start to realize that this strength is most suited at this stage for earning your rewards of ibadah, doing good works, and avoiding sins and reprehensible actions. And at the same time, you're so strong and passionate that also be very careful for this is the age where most people become inclined towards desires. So that and everybody has a potential cycle that they might go through where at this age, desires are very, very, very strong 
and so one might incline a lot towards haram. But one can also channel the same energy that's going towards the haram and actually transform it and turn it into energy that goes, goes towards really using this time wisely in the obedience of God. Really using this time wisely in the obedience of God. So he said, while it is unusual to find a youth established in obedience and neglectful of worldly desires, even Allah mentions, or it's mentioned in the hadith that your Lord wonders at a young one who shows no passions, who doesn't exercise their passions. And another hadith, this is really amazing hadith, that one of those among the seven on the shade of Allah's throne on the Day of Judgment is the young man or young woman who grew up in the service of God. So growing up in the service of God, so he's defining this as 15 to 35. In a significant portion of that time, if they were using that time to obey Allah and to resist the desires of society, because this is the age in which everybody's like, you can do anything. I can do this, I can go to a party, I can drink, I can go to a club. I have plenty of time to live. I have plenty. I remember when I was in middle school, middle school or high school, um, you know, there was a friend of mine and uh, we would talk about that he was Muslim, we were the only two Muslims in the Middle East that I knew. And he was just like, yeah, well, let's just do all of it, we'll do Hajj when we're like 40. And, and, it, was like, and it was a very like real concept, They're like, yeah, just do Hajj, it erases all the sins, but like, let's, everybody else is living it up, right? So why don't, and so that was like a very real um, uh, thought that crosses the mind when you're young because the desires are strong, everybody's in relationships, Everybody is um, uh, uh, maybe maybe at some point gets caught up in substance using some substance of some sort, and so one wonders why not me. But he says this is what if someone teaches correctly from a young age, and Allah gives them tawfiq, He says their eternity is set for them just based on how they use their youth, because it was such a strong time that they, so much could have gone wrong, especially in, in Western society. So many tests and temptations are in front of us growing up. And so if one is protected from these, alhamdulillah. Um, and so Allah says, subhanAllah, in another narration, that, oh, young man or young woman who has abandoned their passions for my sake, you are to me as are some of my angels. That's how beloved you are to me. You are to me as are some of my angels because you abandon your passions, not because you couldn't physically engage in them. At some point, someone has a desire, they might not even have the energy to act on that desire. No, because you did it for me and for my sake. So he says, this is the age that one should really, um, uh, from 15 to 35, that one should really take um, seriously and one should seize the opportunities in this age. Really, really find ways to use this time wisely in ibadah, in worship. As one gets older, the himma is just not there. One can't just go the same amount of time without sleeping as much or without eating as much. Um, fasting might become more difficult. A lot of things become more difficult for somebody. But when that himma exists, instead of exerting all of that himma towards something that's fun or recreational or haram, one should say, I'm going to dedicate a portion of that and dedicate it towards my Lord. And um, as the Prophet ﷺ said in one narration, seize the opportunity. See, is five before five. Your youth before you get old. This is the one he starts with. Why didn't he start with the others? Because this is so important. Seize the age when you are young before you get old, and then your health before you fall sick, your, your extra time, your leisure time before you get busy, your wealth before you get poor, and your life before you die. So life, obviously, all-encompassing, one must seize this life before they die. But the youth before we get old. So my advice to all of us that if we are blessed at this stage or if we have younger siblings or others that to advise and to remind, Allah says, remind for reminding benefits the believers, right? Remind because we sometimes have to remember, you know what? I do have a purpose. There is a, there is a reason I'm here. It's not just going to all go away. And then our role model should be people who accomplished a lot in their youth. Um, spiritually. And then that will help us realize, yeah, they, they can do it. I can hopefully do a portion of that at least. Um, I can do a portion of that. And then in one narration, the feet of a servant will not move away from uh, their place on the day of judgment until they're asked about five things, their life and how they spent it and their youth and what they exhausted their youth in. This is one of the key questions one asks and then their wealth and the five things we listed out. How did they acquire it? What did they do with it? One of the key questions one is asked 
that we will have to answer God for if we have to face reckoning on the day of judgment is what did we do in our youth? What did we do when we were young? How did we spend that time? And it's totally okay, and then we'll end with this, it's totally okay to spend a portion of our time relaxing, hanging out with friends, playing sports, doing recreational things, you know, working out, all these things, totally fine. But what we want to avoid is getting into a phase where our kind of the fun exceeds our seriousness or our seriousness is, is maybe 5% of the time and everything else is just about fulfilling some thing that makes us, um, you know, outwardly, it's, it's really, really exciting. That's what we want to So for some people, it might be that one is struggling to not do haram at this age. That's the most important thing to stay away from. And one, it's much better to just be engaged in recreational, like, um, things than it is to be engaged in anything that's haram or impermissible. But for somebody who's taking the spiritual path seriously, that now it becomes, okay, how, how do I use my leisure time, as the Prophet some said, to do ibadah or to do worship or to do learn some knowledge, like 20 minutes a day, an hour a day, whatever time someone can do, 15 minutes a week, right? To learn some Quran, to memorize some, some Quran, to serve our parents, to serve our elders, whatever that good one can do bring good into our life. And if at young ages we can start to create ways in which we encourage each other to good, like one of my friends, he had this, um, uh, he, he would always, he would one day, sometimes he would just call me and he'd be like, hey, you want to go feed, uh, uh, feed the less fortunate? Like, let's just go pick up a bunch of pizzas and feed the less fortunate. And usually people on the call, they're like, hey, you want to go watch a movie? You want to go and so, okay, now like a couple of friends would get together. They would still get to kick it. They would still get to like eat food and hang out. But in that time, they were praying together and they were feeding people who are less fortunate together. That's like an example of a way in which one is using their energy and their youth, um, uh, that, that, that intention that he had. It was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a way to use that time wisely, right? Um, and so these are examples in which uh, one can try to spend, um, spend their, their, their time. He says, youth is the time when acquiring knowledge, merit, and ideally attaining to positions in the religion and, and um, are, are possible. So um, uh, this is, this is and, 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 a, and then a poet says in one poet, if one does not prevail in the nights of their youth when they're young, then they shall never prevail even if they live, live long because is most of your life other than youth, isn't that the most critical part of your life? So take what you can from it and don't neglect it. Neglect it not. Um, and they, the righteous predecessors used to advise those when they see young people. They said, use your youth before you become like us. Old, feeble, and too weak to perform any acts of goodness. Right? And um, that, that at some point, a regret might sink in. Uh, that, you know what, I could have done so much more. Why didn't I do it? We don't want to be in that stage. We want to be in the stage where we say, you know what, alhamdulillah, yes, I could have done more, but I did do my best. That's what we should teach ourselves, our children, and anyone in this stage, that there's a purpose and there's a time, and this is the key time, this age, and this age has a uh, time limit, and it expires. And as Imam Ghazali says in one of his books, that your time is your capital. Every minute or second that goes away is time you'll never get back. Ever. You can't buy that back. Someone can give you a billion dollar investment um, or a billion dollars and just hand to you and you can never say, you know what, I'm going to buy back the last one hour of my life. Impossible. So using time wisely, investing in it, investing it to then reap rewards for the Akhira is of the utmost importance. And um, specifically, we should try to make sure we do it in this stage. And the stages leading up before youth should help lay the foundations for using the time wisely after. So with that, we'll end. Um, and then uh, next time we'll get into the stage of maturity, advanced age is called seniority, which is 50 to 70. Um, so maturity is about 35 to 50 and then 50 to 70. And then after that, um, it's uh, uh, one is when passing into the stage of decrepitude and then uh, one passes away. So this is like the general structure. Anybody can pass away at any time, obviously, um, as, as was mentioned in the beginning. So with that, if there's any questions, we'll do a few questions. Yeah. Yes, the five for five. So it is, um, good question. It is, seize the opportunity to make use of five things before five things. Your youth before you grow old. Your health 
before you fall sick or lose your health. Um, your free time or leisure time before you become busy and occupied. That's the third. The fourth, your wealth before you grow poor. And fifth, your life before you die. These are the capital um, that the human being has in this life. Yes? Um, like using your life before you die? That part? It's a good question. Um, so I think the first four are actually kind of like commentaries on the final one, basically. So it's like your youth before your old age, your health, before, because your life essentially is your time and your health and your, um, your, your money, your income, and then overall your um, ability, right? And those are, those are the constitutions essentially of your life. But you can think about that in a, in a, in a deeper way as well, where um, one uses the ultimate purpose of their life wisely. So it's not just that, okay, I'm going to use like the day-to-day -day wisely, but like I'm marching towards a direction and I know what that direction is. And I know that I'm moving towards a direction where I'm going to meet Allah. So I'm making intentions regularly, even if I can't do the action. I'm hoping and planting the seeds, even though I don't see the fruit being, um, you know, the, the, the ultimately coming to fruition and so on. So that's the, the kind of sense I get. You know? sorry, sorry, something that preserves... Right, yeah, something that preserves your 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 your, um, your humility and fosters in the traits that Allah wants us to get in this life um, to ultimately present ourselves before Him. So once someone dies, it's done. There's no deeds left. I mean, there's a few deeds. Your sadaqah jariyah, and then your children can donate certain deeds in your favor. But for the most part, your deeds are done. So the Prophet ﷺ was constantly reminding us, and is constantly reminding us, use the entire life that you have because. That's it, 40 years, 60 years, 70 years, and then after that, it's eternity. So every minute had a major impact in the next life if, if one used it or didn't use it. Yeah, uh, yeah sister. Uh, what, can what is that? Good question. Um, to what extent can du'a change your provisions or what's written for you? So there's various hadith which talk about the impact of du'a, and then what is meant by um, uh, what's written, and then the different stages of something that is actually written. The mo the thing that we should operate under is that du'a can change things. Um, there's one narration which mentions um, that du'a can change your qadr. At a very different level, though, and this is a plane we can't understand, Allah already knew that you were going to make that du'a, and he enabled you and inspired you to make the dua. And so at a higher plane, in a higher dimension, because Allah is eternal and doesn't operate in past, present, or future, it's all present for Allah, um, it was already given to you. But the way that we should think about it is that, um, uh, that our dua can have an impact. And then beyond that, everything will just lead to like philosophical confusions because the human being, the human uh, intellect can't interpret these different realms, the realm of the Jabarut and the Malakut and so on and so forth. It'll just lead. So, so, so the, the, the khulasa is the summary is that um, we, something is written. We make dua for things that, and we're, if we're inspired to make those duas, then we hope that those duas inshallah will be accepted and will always result in some form of good for us. But it gets very nuanced. That question is like the question that the greatest thinkers of the religion have grappled with and have written lengthy, lengthy books about. Um, yeah. yeah, Omar. Right. Daddy. Uh, Daddy. Uh, how, you know, it's like, it's like, how, how would you say there should be balance with, you know, to encourage children to live the things that they want to do in a society that has all this power and all this uh, sin? And at what age would they put aside? It's okay to have those kids and things that you want to do in a society. The rest of them just be kind of. Yeah. So the question is, um, the, the question is about, you know, how, how do we think about 
what we expose our children to and how you protect them without um, keeping them in a, in a, in a, you know, space bubble the whole time, um, which, you know, sometimes I try uh, with that. Uh, I can't find one that works. And uh, yeah, if you have one, let me know. Um, and then, and then at what point do we like start exposing them to things to kind of expose their, you know, build their immune system. Um, so what, what has been taught in our uh, understanding is one has to do their best, but one cannot rely only on their efforts. So that's the first principle here, meaning you have to rely on Allah at the end of the day. And if one is not coupling their, protect, their um, attempts at protecting their children from haram with du'a regularly in the hajjah, breaking themselves before their Lord in the deep parts of the night, weeping before Allah, Ya Allah, protect my children, Ya Allah, protect my children, then one can expect that one is essentially relying on their efforts, right? If, if, and it doesn't have to be at that time specifically, but that's the time that we are taught in our religion where the the, um, the abid, the worshiper, is, is having their intimate moments with their Lord, begging their Lord for whatever deep things are on their mind. And so this should obviously be one of them, um, given how important it is. So that's the first thing. Reliance is ultimately on Allah. Um, because you could do all the things, and it's, it's up to God what direction he takes somebody in. That being said, one does take all the precautions, and um, it should be done so in a wise manner where you don't normalize things just because the society you live in has normalized them. So it's almost like sometimes we might water something down and say, well, yeah, no, it's fine. Everybody's doing it, so I have to socialize them. No, 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 no. hold on a sec. Just because everybody's doing it doesn't make it okay. And this could be something as small as, I mean, it's not small, but for example, if our children go to public school and they learn history written by these occupying Zionist-minded people, incorrect history, history that overemphasizes one group of people and everybody else is just thrown under the bus, at least what we were taught in school. Um, now you're going to teach your children something. And then as Muslims, you don't learn anything prideful about your history, even though while the dark ages were happening for the Europeans and for the Kofar, the enlightenment was happening for the Muslims. And so they don't teach you these things. So from that, even that agenda has an intention behind it. I would argue it's essential for Muslims to protect for, against that agenda, but everybody would have their own kind of approach to doing it. But the fundamentals of not exposing them to haram, there's five. There's what you see, what you listen to, what you say, what you eat, um, uh, and then what you basically let into your, into your heart, thoughts that you let into your heart, the frameworks, the philosophies that you're exposed to. One has to do their utmost to do whatever they can to protect them from the, the most difficult of haram. Even if that you might consider it over sheltering, I would, um, our teachers have mentioned that in the society we live in, because it's been watered down so much, the, the bar has become really, really low. So it's highly unlikely that one is going to, um, uh, to kind of go over, over the top, right? But it depends on your own himma and your own intentions for your children, right? So. Um, if you go into like a grocery store and they have, you know, some random song playing, like, and you're like, I can't let my child listen to the song, so I'm going to leave the grocery store. There's like a nursery rhyme playing. And you're like, my the instruments are haram. I mean, then that's a, that, that. I don't prescribe to that. I would think that's a little much. But if somebody wants to, that's their prerogative, right, to do that. But if like somebody is like, you know, playing highly inappropriate music in front of your children, and they're just listening to it and being exposed to it, we know that has a spiritual reality to it. And one might want to avoid maybe going to like a concert where that that is taking place. Right? So you, everybody is going to have their bar and um, going to expose it. So it, the intellect must be guarded, the heart must be guarded, the eyes must be guarded, the ears must be guarded, and the people who we hang out with. And do they talk about gossip? Do they talk about that? Do they backbite? Do they do we backbite? Like all the things we do as parents that our children are exposed to. Sometimes it's it's, it's on us that we have to start with always, and then kind of talk about what else they're exposed to. Um, media is arguably the biggest door to shade. It is the biggest uh, satanic influence, it is. So to do so effectively would mean to shut off majority of media access. That's that's what the view of these I prescribe to. Um, so I would not recommend having a television in your house um, and, and not letting at least like a, like a limitless um, watching of these types of things, highly, highly, highly regulated uh, intentions of what's being consumed. But that might be, not something that uh, you know everybody would, would do, but the, uh, up to everybody individually. Um, but just being mindful of what haram influences can come through these types of things. The last question about when do we start exposing their immunity, you never throw them out there to expose their immunity to the haram. 
what we're taught is you explain to them, like you get to a certain point and now a child might start having feelings for the opposite gender. You don't just say, hey, go experience it. It's instead you say, hey, you're at this point now. Let's talk about what does that actually mean. And so knowledge in our religion always, always, always start. It starts everything. And knowledge is, in our religion is amazing because the Prophet ﷺ talked about everything. There was no, no topic that was too uncomfortable in the hadith. Everything, intimacy, all of these things are all spoken about, right? Like it's not something that is that we're shy from. We're especially when it comes to protecting someone's religion. So um, uh, one would teach them through knowledge and through examples of what not to do, and still I think protect from people who might expose, um, you know, be, be 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 exposed to that. But um, all of everything I just stated is purely theoretical because I only have a child who's very small. So to the parents in the room who have much older children, is there, is there advice you would add to that? Um, uh, yeah. Uh, I want to make a comment just to the advice. Since we were talking about the dua, my understanding is like, we should make dua and expect the Lord to answer us. And what I've learned is not to, like you ask him for a specific thing and look for that to be the answer, that specific thing to be the answer. Right. Like a, a harm removal or something better or something in the hereafter. Like so don't don't expect that I uh, want this job right here. Right. I think that job is going to come. Right. So I learned not to look just for yeah, yeah, always the dua the other is the end of Ya Allah do what's best for me. Mm-hmm. And because you, I don't know what's best, you were the most knowledgeable. Yeah. But all the advice about um, you know it's like exposure and stuff. It's, it's already been mentioned, like the company, like the parents being alive with their own surroundings. This is what your kids are going to be exposed to. So, you know, so basically, when you're married, your parents' friends are married, when they do start to have those other thoughts, they're going to think, okay, mm-hmm. these feelings are okay for the center boundaries of marriage, the center institution of marriage. You know, so it's like Islam already has like the blueprint and now you can put everything in this each department you know where it goes and they'll see where it all fits so and then it's really no shelter in the anything but once your kid asks you about something they know more than what you think you know so it's just everything you say like just teach them all the foundations of being, and being that nothing is too early to teach them about and then once they start to get exposed to certain things and then just to add to what you said, this is more of a tangible experience that I had. I was over at a relative's house, and I remember like one of the daughters was of married age, right? And then the other one is around like 10 years old. So then I asked them, okay, well, what you like what's your plan on being married? Are you okay with more than one life? And then the 18 year old looks at me and goes, Why would I have a problem with that? Something wrong. I was like, Okay, that's interesting. And then I go to the little 10 year old, small little 10 year old. And then I ask her in the most like, kind way, like, Who do you want in your husband? And are you okay with the not a one of one life? And then she looks at me with the sweetest tone and just goes, like, It's in the Quran. Why would I have a problem with that? And then, like, in that moment, I was like, Oh my goodness. Like, whatever this brother is doing, like on the lot because it's like like and it's like what you were talking about with the fifth room. It's like we as a community or we as individuals at times we have the capacity to conduct even the most best things that are lost put in front of us. But if you preserve it and like really go close to the need, like it can be a part of your own school child. Like some of the like greatest topics of our community can be overly simplified by like this the heart of a child. Uh-huh. Jazakallah khair for sharing, sharing them. Thank you so much. Uh, and any of the sisters? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, in reference to what most of the brothers said about like exposing and then children oversimplifying, I feel like children oversimplify because they don't have a concept of ego and arrogance. Mm-hmm. They, they're, they're operating on the and just the So we as the parents or family members or siblings, Start to add in, stir the pot, and add ingredients mm-hmm. based on culture, based on our Akita or like our 
interpretation of the Quran and stuff like that. Right? Then we start adding to the soup. But um, in terms of like exposure, right? We can only do so much. Reliance on Allah is, is first and foremost. Daddy! But, like, me, personally, I'm, I'm a reaper. So, like, my family, they're, they're not strange. Uh, there is not one, right? Um, because of that, right? I'm looking towards the future, right? Inshallah, whatever Allah has made, my children or no children. How do I circumvent or circumnavigate relationships with ties and navigating protecting my child? And what if protecting my child comes at the cost of maintaining the relationships with the people? Or if you're going to the Muslim right people with maybe improper Akita. Right. How do you like, compensate? Is that is that a, a question? Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, so the question is, what, as, as if we are engaging with um, family members who are non-Muslims, um, or maybe a Muslims, but they're not practicing, or maybe have an incorrect understanding of things. What's the balance between maintaining the family ties, but then not allowing our children or ourselves to be impacted by that? Um, so there's one always begins with the spiritual elements, and then one goes into the practical elements. So Allah mentions in the Quran um, that the when you recite the Quran, Allah puts a hijab between you and between those who do not believe. What does that mean? That the recitation of the Quran in and of itself and doing certain uh, uh, types of adhkar in the morning and in the evening and then reciting certain surahs will automatically allow for a shield in the spiritual realm to protect one. This shield has multiple advantages. It has the advantages of, um, uh, of protecting the heart against the sins and protecting the mind against problematic ideologies, improper aqidah, or just atheistic philosophies and so on and so forth. So at minimum, um, one does the three quls, qul wa uh, uh, so the falak surah nas, three times in the morning, three times in the evening, the ayat of kursi. And then there's various other supplications. Um, many have that book or the app, Fortress of the Muslim, right? That It has them all in there of the du'as one should do in the morning and the evening. Those must, those should be taken more seriously than any physical medicine we take. If we have a pain and we take Tylenol before we ask Allah for that pain, we're, to be relieved of the pain, we haven't realized really um, the, 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 who is the one who's going to relieve pain. Similarly, when it comes to these things, the spiritual precautions one starts with. That's the first. The second is, um, with that understanding in mind, one always keeps a balanced approach to engaging with um, family and with people who might have kind of an improper understanding. So until they've done something wrong, one does not assume that they will do something wrong, right? So if um, we go over to someone's house and nothing wrong has happened, but then our child tells us, hey, I saw them do this or do this or do whatever else it is that was like, you know, maybe uh, uh, they said something that was inappropriate or um, some someone might have drank alcohol in front of them, but you didn't know that they were going to do that. Now one knows, okay, hold on a second. Um, if I knew before that they would for sure do that, I should not take them to that environment. But if it happens like where you had no understanding that that haram was going to take place, um, you now explain, okay, that's not something we do, right? This is something that is not from our religion. And one walks through the, um, uh, the, the, the wisdoms in our religion um, behind why that's not appropriate and why it's actually a better lifestyle than one lives if someone stays away from those haram things. Um, now, when one interacts with those people, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. I can do it in environments where that's not going to take place. So if everybody is going um, uh, to a dinner where for sure there's gonna be a lot of drinking, there's gonna be a lot of these things, perhaps I don't take my children to that dinner, but I just go to say salam and to, or to say hello, whatever else it is with my you know, non-Muslim family. Um, or one says, you know what, I'm just gonna stay away from it. I'm gonna invite them to my house. And I'm gonna invite them to my house a lot. And when they invite them to my house, say, hey, no alcohol in my house, none of this, but you, we're gonna eat, we're gonna have barbecue, we're gonna, we're gonna do all the different things, um, you know, but we're not going to engage in those types of things. One can meet up at, um, you know, a picnic or something. So one finds creative ideas. I know one of many of our teachers, actually, many of our shu, their families are non-Muslims or they converted to Islam eventually after like decades. They still would go to the family reunions. They still would go to the different things, but they would just very wisely navigate what was being done and would just remove themselves from certain situations when that situation got to a kind of bad instance. 
when it comes to the Muslim family members, um, uh, one has to be careful that improper aqidah usually very rarely is discussed in um, like a social setting, for example. So, for, so if somebody believes and doesn't prescribe to the school of Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'ah, let's just say that even if they're Shia, it's highly unlikely one is going to get into that discussion in like a family dinner. I would not think it's wise to say I'm never going to see that person because their aqidah, they prescribe to this school of thought and I prescribe to this school of thought. That would be in the realm of where Allah says, Wala and do not, do, do not um, create sectarianism and sectarian differences. This is something that the Muslims have, we really struggle with as a community with Alhamdulillah, that at least now we are uniting against Zionism and we're as Muslims, Sunnis, Shias, Sufis, Wahhabis, everybody is uniting, right? But, but Otherwise, there was a lot of this, you're this, I'm this, so we can't hang out. Um, and, and, and lastly, one tries to show our family the good in people instead of finding the one or two things that they do. Every one of us is imperfect and every one of us is going to sin, but it doesn't mean that we stop interacting socially. We always try to say, you know what? Yeah, maybe that person didn't pray at the gathering and it's not ideal. I'm not never going to go to their house because they didn't pray. Um, but instead, we're going to talk about, you know, they did, they fed us a really good meal. They spent a lot of time cooking for us. That feeding people, as mentioned in the Quran, is a virtue. So one tries to show the positives of that um, instead, especially when these are sparing interactions and not like day-to-day -day interactions. In the day-to-day -day interactions, I would uh, advise us being a lot more careful about who is exposed to, but like once every three months, six months, the random uncle that, you know, maybe no one is, is the closest to, um, that that uncle might say a thing, few things and you just kind of remove yourself and say, hey, I'm going to go check on the pie or something and just like get out even if there's no pie, just get out of the situation. So um, we're at time and we're getting, it's getting pretty late. So um, I think we're going to conclude if there's any questions online, we'll take one question online and then we'll um, go to them. So. So this course, uh, the class is 7 p.m. Pacific time. Um, we're in California, uh, Oakland, California. It's live uh, streamed every week, but 7.15 is it actually starts. Um, Oakland, California, Lighthouse Mosque. The name of the book, for those who are asking, is The Lives of Man by Imam Al-Haddad. That's what we're talking through, and we just started the text. Uh, the name of the book, uh, The Lives of Man. The Lives of Man, yeah, short book. Highly recommend get it on Amazon for like twelve dollars. By uh, Imam Al Haddad, H A D D A D. So if we didn't get to the questions, we'll get to them next time. Apologies um, uh, for that. And these questions, these uh, will be posted for those who are asking. Um, it will be posted on YouTube. Um, uh, the live, there's also a live stream on the uh, MCC East Bay YouTube in case anyone. Um, so we're live streaming to MCC YouTube. So for those asking, um, Muslim Community Center East Bay YouTube channel, inshallah it'll be posted like, you know, next couple of days. We'll go ahead and make the last one. I'm not going to name Hamdan Bahar Bilal mean Allahum Sali was Sadam Mubarak Ala Sayyidina Muhammad and Bil Ovalin, but Sali was Sadam Mubarak Ala Sayyidina Muhammad and Bil Akhiri, but Sali was Sadam Mubarak Ala Sayyidina Muhammad and Bil Malala Lala Yomidin. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا ذاب النار ربنا أبتغ لنا صبرا وثبت قدامنا وانصرنا للقوم الكافرين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم يا وحاب يا تواب يا قوير يا حسين يا حفيد يا حفيد يا حفيد يا أرحم الراحمين يا رحيم المساكين يا رب we ask you يا الله you are the most merciful you are the one who protects you are the one who gives strength يا الله that you that you bestow your mercy and your protection يا رب العالمين and your assistance upon our brothers and sisters in Gaza and Palestine يا رب العالمين يا الله that you stop the oppression and the corruption and the genocide and all of the things that are taking place there. Ya Rab, we ask, Ya Allah, on behalf of all of those who cannot ask, on behalf of all of those who are struggling, who don't have food, that you feed them, who don't have water, that you give them water to drink, who don't have clothing, that you clothe them, who don't have families, that you take care of them. Ya Rab, we ask that you put them under your special protection, your special inaya and your special wilaya. Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask that you take care of, of the Muslimin. We ask that you give faraj to the Muslims in Gaza, to the Muslims in Palestine, Ya Allah, we ask that you give them the best of faraj, the best of relief, the best of mercy, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask that you give 
relief to this ummah and that you give victory to this ummah and that you give them victory over these kuffar, ya Allah. We ask that you make their feet firm and that you give them patience and that you give them tawakkul in you and that you give them the highest and highest and highest of rewards in the highest stations of Jannah, Ya Rabbil Alameen, for all of the difficulty and adversity and tribulation and sacrifice that they are making. We ask that you accept all of those who have passed as shuhada and that you give them the highest station of shahada and that you give them the best of lives in the next life, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask that you that you help those, Ya Rabbil Alameen, who are struggling, Ya Allah. You say that you do not turn away the dua of the oppressed, and there are so many who are oppressed who are turning to you, Ya Allah. We are weak before you as an ummah. We have nobody to turn to, no country, nobody, no ruler, but we have you, Ya Rabb, and you are all we need. We turn to you, Ya Allah, as an ummah, Ya Rabbil Alameen, on behalf of our Muslims, Ya Rabbil Alameen, on behalf of this ummah, we ask you, Ya Allah, that you send your special, special, special assistance and protection and strength and madad and, and, and special, special, special rahma and mercy, Ya Rabbil Alameen, to the children, to the men, and to the women, and to the elderly, and to all of those in Philistine who are suffering, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and to the Muslims all around the world who are suffering. We ask that you give relief to this ummah. We ask that you allow us, Ya Allah, in the blessings that we are that we are soaking up and in the time that we have and in all the health and all the wealth and the protection and the comforts that we have that you let us take advantage of these moments and that you let us seek knowledge and that you let us worship you properly and that you let us focus on you and that you do not allow our time to be wasted and that you do not allow us to be people of distraction and people who waste our lives away we ask that you allow us to use our lives wisely and to use our lives in the best of ways and to use our lives in accordance with the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam wa we ask you for everything good the prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam asked for and we ask that you give us protection for everything evil that he sought protection from sallallahu wa sallam wa barik ala khayri khalqin sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sallam wa alhamdulillah